I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings obliteration. I must face my fear and permit it to pass over me and through me. Hello everyone, the saga of Dune is far from over with Dune Part 2 arriving in cinemas. And yes, I've finally seen Dune Part 2 in cinemas. As a fan of the novels, I have some nitpicks over the changes and what was missing. But that being said, this film is a reminder to why we go to the movies. Even though it's a bit tad overhyped online, I feel, it still is a wonderful film from Denis Villeneuve. And it sets up an interesting angle to adapt Dune Messiah, I must say. And that got me thinking about the Dune films. Now, there have only been two feature films with an extended cut of the original Dune in 84. But even though it's technically TV miniseries, I'm going to count Frank Herbert's Dune and Frank Herbert's Children of Dune because you can watch them on DVD. And even though it's a miniseries format, it feels like one long movie. So I'm just going to go over the live action Dune adaptations. And no, that's not going to include the live action sequences from the PC game. This is just going to be a quick ranking of what my personal favorites are. And I am going to count Dune 1 and Part 2 separately and then together to give you an idea of like my feelings towards them. And you know, despite the changes, it's nice seeing Dune made in such high quality. The technology is there to tell the story. And most of all, you can kind of see the difference between readers and non-readers, but I love that people are discovering the world of Frank Herbert, Arrakis, Dune. And I just love the world of Dune with Frank Herbert and then what his son continued with Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. I mean, I just love the entire universe of Dune. My brother, like I said in my previous video, you can check that out. I go over the novels. My brother got me into Dune. With least favorite, I, I love all of them for different reasons. It would have to be the 1984 extended cut. And I actually really dig this three hour version. This is like my preferred method. The only reason why it's a little bit lower is that sometimes with the animation with the storyboards and like the narration, it can feel a bit boring at the beginning. You also don't have Princess Irulan narrating over the story. You know, it's not like Virginia Madsen narrating the tale of some older gentleman. It's like, here, Paul Muad'Dib. Like, that's the way it was like with the narration. But I do like that David Lynch had them have an internal monologue. Because, you know, when you read novels, characters are always thinking to themselves. It's in their perspective. You know, it's kind of cool how you could hear Paul, like, think to himself. That was, like, something very different, even for back then. And I like that. And it's a wonderful cast. Patrick Stewart is Gurney Alec in the 84 film, and you have two Professor Xavier's in Dune films. I mean, how cool is that? It's just basically more of the original, but David Lynch was ashamed of this version. It was basically an extended version. It wasn't like a pure director's cut per se. His name comes across as Alan Smithy at the beginning of the movie. But I have to say for the two hour runtime, stuff that was dragged out in the Denis Villeneuve films is told in a much better, more efficient pace in this film. Despite the embellishments it takes with the weapons, um, <laughs> pronunciation of words, and who could forget the voice? Johnny! By today's standards, some of the effects look silly, but what can I say? There's a certain charm, and who could forget the music by Toto? After that would be Dune Part 1. Now, it's kind of unfair to judge this because I consider it half a film. That's why I didn't fully go over it when it first came out. I couldn't fully judge the films until the second half was there. And I knew they were going to cut it in half, but I was shocked that it was done so early because, like, reading the book, it's in three acts. I would have assumed they would have ended it in Act 2 before the time jump, you know? Part 2 would have been Alia already being born, Paul Atreides' kid being killed, all that type of stuff. I thought that's where they're going to go with it. And they took a bit of a different approach, but I have to say I love Timothy Chalamet in this. I thought he was perfect casting because you need somebody who's a little bit naive to the world, but then strong. You know, there needs to be somebody with a bit of darkness underneath. He could play Paul when he's like leaving Caladan, arriving and learning the ways of Arrakis, surviving the tragedy. And then he could be the brutal bastard that he is in the books. As a matter of fact, Denis Villeneuve cast this film very well. Rebecca Ferguson is fantastic as Lady Jessica. Oscar Isaac is Duke Leto. You have Stellan Scar. Guard <laughs> as Baron. Oh man. Jason Momoa as Duncan Idaho. Josh Brolin as Gurney Alec. And who could forget Hans Zimmer's score, the Gonja Bar scene. And it's nice seeing more stuff fleshed out. Despite certain things being changed or missing from the book, I also love the cinematography. I wish they would release an IMAX version of the two films like they did Transformers or Dark Knight. Despite that, this is a film like Part 2 that I feel is a little bit overrated. Forget the changes of books, you know, you could always like talk about stuff 
of what it's missing instead of talking about what it is. And what this film is, is it's a very good film, solid start, but something feels a bit soulless to me compared to the other incarnations. I feel like it needed to be a two and a half hour movie with something that could have been told in a more efficient and shorter amount of time. And that's why part one, like by itself, is lower. But also, who could forget Zendaya introduces Chani, and uh, Javier Bardem is still Gar. Even in the early scenes he has in this film, it's just great. I think what's frustrating about the changes that people have is that, like, yes, stuff's missing, but they had two films, and they still left out a lot of stuff and felt like they had to rush certain things, even though they had two movies. Now, if it was one movie, I could understand that, but two? I don't know. The best way to view Dune, the new films, is like Deathly Hollows Part 1 and 2. Yeah, they're their own films, but really, it's kind of unfair to judge them on their own when together they're one complete film. It's not like Matrix Reloaded to Matrix Revolutions or Back to the Future 2 and 3 or even like Infinity War to Endgame. No, it's like the same film split in two parts. But overall, this is a solid start for a new incarnation of Dune and I'm glad that a brand new generation of fans got into the story through this film. After that would be the theatrical version of the 1984 Dune. This film, despite taking embellishments, told the story pretty well and got a lot in its two-hour runtime. David Lynch went through a lot of stuff. Dino De Laurentiis produced this. You have Sean Young as Chaney. You have Kyle MacLachlan. He is probably one of my favorite Paul Atreides actors. He is awesome in this. Long live the fighters! I just love that scene with the water of life. And he's just like, Father, the sleeper has awakened! I mean, there's just so many quotable lines in this. The Baron is just grotesque. That's one thing I have to say. This one's really weird and out there. The flaw this film has is that it's not as true to the novelization as, say, even Denis Villeneuve's film. Like, despite it changing stuff and leaving out, it's a lot closer to the novel than the 84 film. But I love the music by Toto. Sting as Fade is awesome. Jose Ferrer as the Emperor. You get... Patrick Stewart is Gurney Alec. Duke Leto is played by an actor who is in Das Boot. So many people in this film. They even have Piter. And I just love the aesthetic. There's just something so original and iconic. And what I, one thing I love about Dune here that was kind of missing for me in the new films is that in the original, yeah, they did some changes, but like you could feel the passage of time like the book where it starts off and then there's just a lot of stuff that happens. And to shorten that, they do kind of do a whole music video montage of like Paul and the Fremen destroying the spice manufacturing plants and stuff and destroying spice production. And that's kind of sped up a bit. They also had room for Alia, which was awesome. It's like, my brother's coming, for he is the Quizzit's Hatterack. And who can forget the knife fight? For the technology, this movie did a lot. And it's it's great to see how far we've come with the miniseries and then the new films really stepped it up where you're just like, wow, you're so immersed in the new world. And that's one thing I did like about this is how each house had their own aesthetic and everything. Overall, this is just a classic. And I don't care if it's not entirely like the book. It's, I still enjoy this film, you know, as a Dune fan. Many people got into Dune because of this movie. After that would be the miniseries of Frank Herbert's Dune in 2000. This is one that I was like, wow, what is this going to be like compared to the original? But I saw it on sci-fi and my brother, this was the same year or the year after was a year that he gave me his copy of Dune and I read it in fifth grade. And you know, despite the casting choices and the limited budget, this one is far more faithful to the novel than some of the other incarnations. And they had time, you know, it was a TV miniseries. They had time to flesh everything out and keep it as close as possible to the novel. Alec Newman, I always liked him as Paul Atreides. I think he's better in the sequel Children of Dune than he is in this one. But what I like is that, you know, again, Paul's kind of like, he's, he's strong. He's learning the Bene Gesserit way, is a weirding way. You see him even with this bowl cut at the beginning. He's just like, he hasn't been through it, you know? And then once he goes through some shit, he becomes like a badass. There's that one line in this one where it's just like, the end game has already been written. And even the voice, that's one thing I have to say, the new film and this miniseries have some great uses of the voice. He's like, submit. Captain. You know, he's like talking. The Worms look menacing. It's probably my favorite design of the Worms. William Hurt is Leto. He's good. The Baron in this is really good. He does a great job. I forgot the actor's name who's on Casino Royale and Walk in the Clouds. He plays Emperor Shaddam. The fourth, Princess Irulan is really good here. They kind of change her character a bit, but one thing I love about the miniseries and the novel is like the kind of behind the scenes political element of it with the different houses. This one has the banquet scene. The Water of Life, they have like 
Paul and Cheney's kid getting killed, like in the novel. And I think that brings more motivation. You know, the new one, he drinks the water of life and then it's just like a turn. And that works, but I feel like you're missing something there. It's like watching Godfather and not having the death of his wife, the car bomb. You don't get to see, even though he's done atrocious stuff and he's like has it in him, you don't see the tipping point of what causes a character to go completely the opposite way. And that's one thing I like about this is you get to see like why he's afraid of running into his destiny, but then once he does, he's just like, he's Muad'Dib, you know? I also love seeing the Fremen culture here. They had the proper relationship with Chani and Stilgar. Like the characters and everything felt more accurate to the novel than some of the other incarnations. That being said though, what holds this one down is the limited budget and then the casting. I don't think the cast was as strong in this film as in Children of Dune. But overall, I mean, for an adaptation on TV that was from 2000, this rocks. And as we know, the saga of Dune is far from over. After that would be Children of Dune. I remember recording this on VHS in 2003. This was probably the first film or miniseries, the first time I ever saw James McAvoy. And you know what's cool? Is that with Anna Taylor-Joy as Alia now in the new one, She's going to be in Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, which means besides two Professor Xavier's in Dune, we have two people from the movie Split in two different incarnations of Children of Dune and Dune Messiah. That's kind of cool. I love that. Uh, the Baron here. Oh, man. Part one is Dune Messiah. Two, three are Children of Dune. Dune Messiah is tragic. Brian Tyler, the music here in Dune Messiah is phenomenal. The House of Trades theme, Summon the Warms. Oh, my God. This feels so majestic and epic. Even for a TV budget, this still holds up pretty well. We have Susan Sarandon in this. Alec Newman returns, and I think he gives his best performance as Paul Atreides' Muad'Dib in this film. It's tragic what happens with Chaney and like Princess Irulan and the whole like poisoning her and trying to kill her and the whole political intrigue there is just phenomenal what happens. But also seeing the ramifications of... Muad'Dib's Holy War. Basically, Frank Herbert was kind of upset that people saw Paul Atreides as a hero at the end of Dune. So to further solidify it as a cautionary tale, he made Dune Messiah. And that's one thing I have to say about Villeneuve in this new one, is that he's going there. Duncan Idaho coming back as a Gola. The Stone Burner, take away Paul's sight. That whole ending with the twins is just phenomenal. And the death of Cheney is tragic. And then him going out to die as a Fremen in the desert. Such a crazy ending because when I saw this, I never read the books like past the first one. So it's like, whoa, this was heavy. Two and three is an adaptation of Children of Dune and it's great seeing James McAvoy as Duke Leto II. Oh man, I really hope they get to God Emperor of Dune because it's gonna get crazy, but this foreshadowed a little bit of it. Seeing the preacher character be Paul Atreides, you know? Alia getting possessed by the barren spirit. That's one thing I was kind of upset with the new one is that like they didn't have that. So it's like, there's that cool line, it's like, time to meet your spiritual Gonjabar, you know? And then Princess Irulan kind of become a little bit more of a guardian. They kind of make her a bit softer in this adaptation than she was in the novel, but I love it with a golden path and prophecy and fate. And it's good seeing the characters years later, and this conclusion is epic. Such a sad but action-packed finale, to say the least, and I really wish they would have made more on sci-fi. After that, though, for me, Despite the changes, despite what's missing, I love Dune Part 2 the most. And I don't think it's fair just to put that part, but my favorite adaptation would have to be Part 1 and 2 as one film. Yes, Denis Villeneuve kind of dumbed it down a little bit. They took a lot out. They took embellishments. But you know what? I'm kind of tired of talking about what's not in it. And let's talk about what it is, you know? You can... Give that excuse to Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings are still excellent films. They took many embellishments from the book. This, despite the changes and everything, still stayed as close to the book as it could when it did. And it had the essence of it. And I think that is the most important thing. I would have watched a four to five hour version of just these two movies put together. But part two continues right where part one left off. And if you're on the fence on part one, two, for me personally, still suffer some of the same problems. But unlike one, this one is the payoff to part one. So you get the payoff for what was set up in part one. It starts right after Timothy Chalamet is great as Paul in this. And part of that is that your hero, or should I say protagonist, is only good as your villain and antagonist. And Austin Butler, once he arrives as Fade, yeah, just the movie takes it to a whole new level. I love this, seeing him deal with the ways of the Fremen. And one thing that I found interesting in Dune Part 2 is that Chani 
doesn't really trust Paul entirely, you know? They changed her character, but I kind of like it because it shows you the dangers of like messiahs and belief and everything and faith. I mean, you can just, that can be an allegory for anything in this world. And that's so crazy. They kind of made Jessica a bit more of a villain in this too. It was nuts. Alia, you know, despite not being born, it was cool seeing how she was like aware before she was born, seeing the future version played by Anna Taylor Joy. Oh man, I love seeing certain moments. They get more with them disrupting the spice in this one. It's not just done in a quick montage. Him and Cheney's relationship is great. The warm ride, the sound and coloring on this with the cinematography is just chef's kiss on this second part. They weren't lying when they said they go Empire Strikes Back on this one. And Christopher Walken surprised me as the Emperor and Florence Pugh is great. The whole cast is excellent. And for me, Harvey Bardem, Zendaya, and Austin Butler are the standouts, but everybody else, they do have their moments to shine. And I will watch part one and two on 4K for years to come. There's gonna be a double pack, I'm gonna get that. And you know, I can nitpick here all day being a fan of the novels, but it's kind of amazing that Denis Villeneuve made something of this quality. And I think he set up an interesting stage for what's to be Dune Messiah years from now. And I hope he does Children of Doom, but if not, they can get another filmmaker to do that in God Emperor Doom, you know? I think that would probably have to be my favorite so far. Story-wise, I think the best one is still the sci-fi miniseries because they're more faithful to the novels, but if we're judging just by a film, this one's just firing on all cylinders. Even though I think that the new films are a tad bit overrated by online media. You can tell people who haven't read the books or are just like, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm like, no, hold your horses, man. <laughs> but... That being said, I mean, how do I feel about the new movies? Here's how I feel. Long live the fighters, everyone. Let me know your favorite Dune incarnations, and also let me know your favorite Dune novels. I love the original one, but I always uh, am a fan of God Emperor Dune, even though it's really out there and weird. And then I really enjoy the Butler and Jihad. And you know what? Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson did give these characters in some way a happy ending with Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune after everything, so... That's kind of cool. And maybe we'll get that years later, I don't know. But uh, in the meantime, those are just my favorites. And to be honest, for me personally, I think that the definitive Dune has yet to be made. Pitch it as a TVMA R-rated show like Game of Thrones. Just pitch it as Game of Thrones in space, but with a style of the David Lynch film, the story of the miniseries and novels and then with the budget and quality of the Denis Villeneuve films. And I think if you merge the three of them together, I think you have the perfect amalgamation of the definitive Dune. But we'll see what happens. Nevertheless, may everyone stay safe and healthy out there. Let me know your favorite Dune novel, and Dune films, live action, or incarnations. Till next time, everyone. Long live the fighters!